Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rafael Almeida. I'm a first year MBA student from Brazil and a director of today's final panel discussion, Mexico's perspective on the current NAFTA renegotiations and possible implications for the region. NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States, was established as a trilateral outlay bloc in North America. And soon after President Trump's election, he announced that the US would begin to renegotiate the terms of the agreement to resolve some issues that he had campaigned for. The outcome of the current renegotiations could result in a US withdrawal that could up, uh, impact the region. Such an outcome will have serious implication, not only for the trade and the economic stability of Mexico and Canada, but also for the immigration, border security, and the labor-intensive industries that rely heavily on the trade among these three, three, these three countries. Our panelists will share their thoughts on how Mexico should respond to a possible US withdrawal, and what actions must be taken to sustain a potential downturn in its economy. The distinguished speakers on our panel is Mr. Richard Brandt, Chief Executive Officer of Lower Electronics, Mrs. Veronica Elizondo, Global Head of Strategic Planning for Sigma Alimentos, Mr. Carlos Cesarman, Chief Financial Officer and Director of Investor Relations of PINFRA, and Mr. Carlos Sa Marcelo Sada, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Source Logistics. The panel will be moderated by Carlos Valderrama, President of Center for Global Trade and Foreign Investments, at the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. In this role, he is responsible for developing and implementing programs to create employment and economic growth by fostering global trade and investments for Los Angeles metropolitan area businesses. He is currently working with Mayor Eric Garcet in developing, organizing, and implementing foreign trade missions and attracting foreign investment to the region. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Mar Carlos Valdehelman and our distinguished speakers. Thank you. <laughs> First and foremost, I want to thank you for your time and for participating in this fantastic panel. We've been doing this for a while here at UCLA, and it's always a great place to have somebody like yourselves dedicating some time to all of us. Allow me just to give you some background for our conversation, because I think it is very important. As you know, NAFTA um, was signed 24 years ago. Canada and Mexico and the United States decided that this was going to be a best sort of agreement for the, for the region. NAFTA indeed has contributed to the economic growth and has made the region more competitive in global markets. The uh, first round of this renegotiation process started in August last year. The seventh round of the negotiations is currently today. We're gonna, I think we're going to have this week in Mexico. And what we can say is that uh, during this last seven months, <coughs> the trade negotiators have modernized and completed some chapters already. However, the proposals and the demands by the U.S. government or the U.S. trade negotiators are still the major obstacles in the overall process. The eighth round, and hopefully the last one, will be held in Washington, D.C. late this, this month. Today, nobody knows how or when these talks will be completed. However, I believe that I am very optimistic that the U.S. is now interested in more in the renegotiating, renegotiation of the agreement than withdrawing from the agreement, and I hope that is the place. However, what we know today is that the agreement will not be the same. There will be a lot of change. And so again, uh, the panelists are individuals that uh, are doing business in both sides of the border. Not only they have employees, but also they work with people like lawyers, accountants, and others that, that indirectly they get involved in NAFTA also as well. And so that is very important. So this, whatever happens, is not going to affect only the companies, but also a number of other companies that they're indirectly involved in international trade. So what I would like to do is ask each of the panelists to briefly tell us a little bit about the, um, your company, your corporate activity, and your involvement in business under the NAFTA agreement. And why don't we start with Richard. Richard? Thank you, Carlos. Thank you all for giving me the opportunity to share with you. Um, my company is uh, founded in 1979. We're in Van Nuys, California, and we build microphones for the security industry. 
which means when you go to Subway and you look up over the cash register, there's a good chance you're going to be speaking to one of our microphones. We're a manufacturer, and that's very important to understand because I still need to distribute the product, and I need end users to be able to buy the product. We have found great favor south of the border uh, with our technology being placed in a number of different applications um, in that area. About four years ago, uh, through some work that we were doing in Mexico, we were invited to participate in the U.S.-Mexico CEO Dialogue. This was put together by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and its, its vision was that we as private sector leadership should have a platform to discuss with public sector leadership what's important for us to, to improve uh, NAFTA, to improve trade relations, uh, and to be able to see efficiencies in flow. Uh, it could sometimes take 60 hours to get a product across the border from the United States into Mexico. Singapore's best, class, best in class was about six hours, 10 hours. I mean, I have it quite right. There are others here that know better. So we're doing everything we can to be efficient about how do we transfer technology, how do we trans transfer product across the border. And I said, I want to be able to be a part of that. And small manufacturer, I don't ship containers, not yet anyway, but I'm very concerned about how we take our product across the border. Um, Mexico is, uh, uh, up until the, uh, uh, the softening of the peso or the strengthening of the dollar, you take your pick, uh, was our number two country to ship to, uh, more than Canada. And so it became very important for us as a small business to maintain the viability of a program like NAFTA that set rules in place for us to be able to participate. Thank you, Richard. Carlos? Yes, my name is Carlos Cesarman. I'm a CFO of PIMFRA. PIMFRA is the largest toll road operator in Mexico. We manage the port of Altamira. Right now we're building a port in Veracruz. So mm -hmm. we're very active in moving merchandises. We're building the road that takes you from Monterrey to Laredo. It's the largest traffic road in the world with 18,000 cars, uh, trucks moving every day. So it's uh, very active. I participate in many boards and I do a lot of venture capital. One of them I'm very sad. I produce movies. I'm not, I was not invited to the Oscars, so I'm pretty frustrated. <laughs> so it wasn't a lucky year. My, my girls were hopeful that I was going there. Uh, I'm part of the Mexican Bolsa board that brings new uh, companies to the market. Uh, so I deal with a lot of things that are happening. And I think that we're in a very complicated conundrum where we are looking at one of the largest markets that had been created in the world, where two economies had mixed together, and where three countries were able to combine production on a very active way. Mexico right now is one of the main uh, population pyramids growing. The U.S. was created with a 1.7% GDP growth from the 1940s to the 1980s. Mexico has been growing at a 2.2% and it will continue growing at that rate for the next 20 to 25 years. It's uh, an economy that has a very deep market for the U.S. And we've gotten confused, no? Um, I'm a believer in manufacturing. I believe that we went away from manufacturing in both countries at a point of time. It's not one side of the border that needs to be concerned. But we've created a supply chain that is super important. If we manage a very fast number, we have created an investment of around a trillion dollars uh, of merchandise moving every year. If we multiply that by five times, which is what about you need to build a factory, we're talking about $5 trillion. So I'm very happy to be concerned about $5 trillion of investment that are being to put in play right now, which it's larger than the deficit of infrastructure of the U.S. planned by Trump, no? Thank you. Veronica? Um, well, I am here on behalf of Sigma. I do strategic planning for them, which means basically the, the how, the when, and the how much we're going to grow. So we got to think of the future. And I also head the organization for global operation for global sourcing. So it's it's kind of part of very very interested in this. 
We are a company that sells $6 billion a year, so it's pretty big. We operate in 18 countries. But of our sales, about 55% of them are sold within Mexico or the U.S. And we are self-sourced in most countries. I mean, we produce in the U.S., we sell in the U.S., we produce in Mexico, and we sell in Mexico. Our products don't really cross the borders, but what does cross the borders is our raw materials. So Mexico is 90% reliant on its, for, uh, on its raw materials for production from the U.S. And to give you an idea, um, we, of your roads and your 18,000 <laughs> trucks, um, we take 200 of those a week, which uh, equals around 450 million pounds a year of raw materials. And of the whole production in the U.S. of turkey thigh, uh, we take, we Sigma, just Sigma the company, we import 14% of that. So we're a big number. And if you think about the, you know, just the, the packaged meats industry in Mexico actually is accountable for 225,000 jobs in the U.S. in the agro, uh, agricultural industry for exporting those products. And we are responsible for about 40,000 of them because we're pretty big and, and we're a major player in Mexico. So we are very involved in this um, NAFTA renegotiations. We're very concerned. We know that, as Carlos mentioned, right now the tables that are being discussed, the issues at hand have more to do with rules of origin right. um, in terms of, of um, you know, uh, renegotiations, terms. But the retaliatory measures is what we are concerned about. And we think that, is the, like you said also, I mean, this is not a, a, a trade agreement where if one party walks out or we both walk out, only one person or one country loses. I think there's a lot of shared interests. We all agree on that. We just don't agree on how to agree to disagree, I guess. Absolutely. So <laughs> we'll keep on talking about Thank that. Marcelo? Thank you. Um, in order to tell you what I do now, I think it's important to, to tell you how I came to, to where I'm currently today. Uh, I'm originally from Mexico, I studied international studies, uh, so I relate to some of you that are kind of in the same pattern. But uh, I, I, I started working on the export of products from Mexico to the U.S. and, and promoting uh, the export of products uh, from uh, uh, companies in, in the late uh, 1980s, uh, early 1990. I mean, actually 1990, bef just before the, the, the free trade agreement was signed. So uh, from there, there, there on, um, I opened a, a consulting company, how to export products to the U.S. So I have lived the curve of uh, pre-NAFTA and then post-NAFTA and, and have witnessed all the different changes through, the, through that time. Uh, I, um, uh, with the consulting company, I moved to L.A. in 1997. The idea was to open a small office uh, and to, to support the sales of products, Mexican products here in, the, in California. And we ended up opening a, a warehouse, a warehouse to, to service the Hispanic industry that uh, we believe that the, the U.S. Uh, operators did not understand. So uh, we opened in a 20,000 square, square foot building. And uh, as of now, we have over one and a half million square feet uh, of, of, uh, of uh, space uh, in eight different cities across the United States. And we are the largest uh, logistics operator for Hispanic goods in, in, in the U.S. We move, uh, uh, I mean, we don't sell the products, but we move around $1 billion in, in products coming from Mexico, Central, and South America into the U.S. market. Uh, very quickly, uh, uh, we, give, we, we uh, give things for granted. Uh, so when a kid comes and sees an iPhone, it's very easy for them to, to manage the, the iPhone. So it's the same with commerce. Uh, a lot of you don't, don't know, but uh, before the free trade uh, in Mexico, if you wanted to buy a gallon of milk, you needed to go to somebody, somebody's house <coughs> because this person used to go in his truck, go to the Sam's, Sam's stores or, or to the U.S. border, put it in his truck, bring it back to Mexico. And that's the way you could get some um, M&Ms or, or milk. And I'm talking... Uh, early 1980s, uh, so every and, and now you go to Mexico and some some places look like the United States. You see all all the products from from the U.S., all the restaurants, all the stores, hotels, and etc. Uh, like uh, same same the other way around. Uh, 
products like Sigma or, 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 or all these products that I'm telling you that we manage, uh, they are here because of the free trade. So it's important to mention that. Thank you. Well, why don't we stay with Marcelo? Uh, as you know, the Los Angeles region is considered to be the logistics capital of the United States because of the large cargo movement that we have here. Last year, over $400 billion of trade went through the ports of LA, Port of Long Beach, and LAX. So Marcelo, um, obviously this is very uh, important industry and you are in it. Um, how is your industry gonna be affected if drastic changes are made to the NAFTA or even if the agreement <coughs> is not ratified? Right, uh, I mean, we, we are a service company, so, so we depend on what our customers do and the, 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 the volume of the, of the movement of, of goods. Uh, also logistics uh, as, as, as this industry is the largest, um, the largest user of, of uh, uh, space, of uh, commercial space in the United States. So, and, and it moves uh, $1.5 trillion in, in uh, spending in between logistics and transportation. So, so it is very worrisome uh, changes on the, on the NAFTA and because whatever that, anything that affects our customers, it affects the logistics itself. So just to put an example, uh, the, the potential issues could be that every product that Mexico exports, 40% is a US content. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you already know this, this kind of rule. So, so that means that uh, if for, for Mexico to manufacture a product has had to buy product from the US. So somebody is creating jobs in the United States, manufacturing products, shipping those into Mexico. They are being transformed and then they're sent back to the US. So if uh, suddenly the free trade agreement is not ratified or then Trump says, okay, enough, uh, or, I want to, or they, he wants to impose a 25% tariff, what's going to happen? The, 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 the United States manufacturer is going to sell less because uh, now the, the final product from Mexico cannot go into the US because it, or, or it has less buyers because now it has a 25% increase. And, uh, and, and the manufacturer from the United States uh, is producing less. So, so uh, they, there are going to be losses of jobs in the manufacturing world in the US because they have less exports to Mexico. Mexico is going to have less exports to the US. And that, of course, is going to affect the $1.5 trillion, that, which is 8% of the GDP in the United States, is going to be affected because the movement of goods is going to be reduced. So, so it is uh, worrisome in that matter. Uh, Veronica, you're, as you said before, you are operating in about 18 countries. So you are a multinational company. We are. And you are. And the agricultural sector in which you're in is a very important industry in North America. Um, there are a number, as a matter of fact, that the great majority of the agricultural sectors, industry leaders, uh, chambers of commerce and others, um, do support NAFTA from the agricultural perspective. On both sides. On both sides. So my question is, what, 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 what are the Mexican counterparts doing to leverage the fact that you have a very strong vocal voice supporting NAFTA in the agro sector? What, what are you doing and in And Mexico? by this you mean like uh, the local pork producers and right. turkey right. producers. To be honest, in the beginning they were a little unsettled. I mean, they, for them it would be better if, if this were you know, they're, they're always going to be more uh, of in favor of more protective tariffs. But the truth is, uh, since we've been declared by the World Health Organization as le uh, free of porcine is the fever for a long time now, they can export anywhere in the world. And so y you have to understand that this is, this is also, we have, we have two types of barriers for ourselves. It's not just commercial, there's also, there's also sanitary. So for the Mexican producers, it's easier to export to Japan, for example, and they pay a lot better prices for their pork products and their turkey products than they would in the US. So our local producers are not really, right now they're not making a lot of noise into this, so they, they don't, they're not acting against it. The other thing is their production is not necessarily the one we would, I mean, we can source some of the product from Mexico, but the dimensions and the yields are very different and so they want a price that we wouldn't pay. So I don't think the commerce would, what we're looking for is 
developing uh, other sources. And we've been looking at Latin America and even Europe for that. Good. Carlos, I, I am very uh, happy that you are here because um, I think the question that I'm going to pose right now is probably more relevant to your industry. Uh, yesterday, President Trump announced that uh, he is planning to increase uh, duty rates on steel and aluminum. Um, comments on, on that proposal. It was my former industry. I used Your to be CFO yeah. of a large steel mill, and now I'm working on the board of another one. But uh, this is the first uh, advice about the dangers of trade wars. And any tax on any industry <coughs> needs to be paid by somebody. So at the end, this is going to hurt the consumer. We companies own your vehicles of getting merchandises, transforming them, and selling them. So at the end, this is a red light for both consumers on the two sides of our borders. And it's a big call for the Canadians. Right now, Mexico is a net importer of US steel the company and the country, so we, we're a net importer. Uh, she will ratify it on NEMAC. Uh, they bring, the, and, and, and the steel industry crosses five or six times on the production of many things. So, so this is a very concerning, uh, alarming thing. For our industry, yeah, it'll make roads more expensive. It'll take longer time to get the returns that we need in the market. It'll make tolls a little bit more expensive. So at the end, consumers are going to be hurt. I think uh, we had been on a very civilizing world of maximizing the ability of, a, of competitive advantage. We were on those times that David Ricardo, the, <laughs> the scientist, would have been very happy. And it's amazing that right now politics and, 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 and expensive manufacturing is defining things. Syndicates are a huge problem in the world. I'm not against syndicates. I, I want to clarify talk about that the, one. The, talk but about I the think union. that union uh, we need to understand pricing. We need to understand that there's a role of three things. I was talking to my former boss, and he was telling me about the problems of the steel industry. He has a plant, some plants in the US, some in Mexico, and some in Brazil. I said the problem in the U.S. is that it has become very expensive to get workers. Not because they don't want to work or they're expensive in manufacturing. If they're very costly to fire. You cannot basic, you, if you had a red button to move somebody that would move the, the, the line and you decide to change the way the line works, you have to put a red button for him to sit down and press it while you get a new guy that will press a green button. And that has created a very expensive scenario of things. Mm -hmm. And that goes along in all the industries. So yeah, this is a red spot that we consumers should be terrified. Terrified. We are going to start paying more, thi more for things. Thank you. Uh, Richard, um, in, in your initial uh, statement, you uh, indicated that you're an active member of the US-Mexico CEO. Um, dialogue group, which is a very prominent group. Um, tell us a little bit more about what you do with uh, government officials that they are involved in the actual renegotiation. And also, would you tell us a little bit about what is the role that uh, this um, group has taken in terms of the rules of origin, the sunset clause, and the dispute resolution in NAFTA? Four good questions. Thank you, yeah. Carlos. Um, First, the U.S.-Mexico CEO dialogue, and I'm going to draw a line, if I may, between the previous administration and the current administration. The U.S.-Mexico CEO dialogue was started in uh, 2013. It was a, uh, uh, brought together by the Chamber of Commerce, in this case the United States Chamber of Commerce, along with CCE, uh, who is the counterpart in Mexico, and the idea was to bring all of us in private sector viable corporations to come together and talk about how do we improve the efficiency of trade. Um, with the uh, new administration, we started to understand very quickly the barriers that were, being, that were being put up were more political barriers than they were actual trade barriers, and that caused a real problem for us. While our gathering would get together and talk about things like safeguarding trade flow, 
if you build a new road, how do I know that when I travel down that road that my, my products won't be hijacked? And I don't mean it to be that direct, but it can be that direct. <laughs> How do I know that instead of it taking 60 hours to get across the border with one railroad crossing and a changing of people in the middle of the railroad um, bridge that we can do a better job of improving trade efficiency? That was our purpose. Uh, now our purpose is to provide the economic data, the statistics that are factual and true, that allow the administration to understand the impact to us of being able to um, improve NAFTA Nothing wrong with that. We didn't have the internet when we were doing this 24 years ago. At least I don't think we were. But today, we've got to make some changes. Um, it, certificate of origin is an important discussion because today our, our business mine is based around 51% U.S. content. And I have to be pretty careful about what is U.S. content. And I'll tell you one inside, and that is your intellectual property residing in either the United States or Mexico is content. What you guys think about, how you participate in the marketplace is part of how a business structure goes, goes to market. So we've talked about the certificate of origin. It gets a little fuzzy in my business, frankly. It's not uh, too different, too, excuse me, too difficult to differentiate certificate of origin. I leave it to folks like my friends, uh, Veronica, who might have a more challenging time, or say your automotive parts. Uh, you know, again, 40% US content going down to the border and bringing it back, well, who owned it originally? And oh, by the way, if we tariff it too much, your car's gonna go up about 20% in its cost of goods. So we're very, we all try to be very careful about how much of it is US content, how much of it could be Mexican content, are we importing, are we exporting, and it begins to, become more complex. It's not checkers, it's chess and it's 3D. Um, so we're having challenges even amongst ourselves and uh, uh, I've been very honored to be a part of this because I'm working with the very large corporations who are committed to making NAFTA a success. Um, the sunset provision is scary for us. Think about it, we've been doing this for 24 years. There are people in this room, I think, who weren't here when we started this 24 <laughs> years ago. And we, we've grown up under a system that makes sense, harmonized tariffs. As just, if I may, for just a moment, I now know what it's gonna cost me to ship my product across the country because we've all agreed on what's the tariff structure. You take this off the table and we have to guess, we have to rethink the cost structure, it's gonna make a huge dynamic change in pricing and our ability to sell product, export, or, as my friends do, import. So we understand that if they don't get this done by July, this thing may shut her down. So we're all working very carefully uh, with the uh, U.S. Trade Representative, Mr. Lighthizer, to try and get him to understand what we as private sector see as, as invaluable in the negotiations so that we can not sunset this thing, but take it out to its more logical conclusion. Um, let me leave it at that point there. Carlos. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's get back to, Mar uh, to Marcelo and before I, I go into a question to my <coughs> new friends from Mexico. Um, obviously in logistics, uh, I'm sure you deal with a lot of things, but tell us a little bit about uh, some of the changes that you're going to see in regards to e-commerce. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, the technology is changing everything and e-commerce e uh, <coughs> definitely is an industry that is growing uh, in double digits. And I don't, I don't see that stopping anytime soon. Uh, logistics needs to be, uh, we, I mean, we all in logistics are trying to adapt uh, faster than the industry, which is hard because the industry is based on technology. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, uh, what I can tell you is like every day, every single day we get uh, requests for e-commerce. There is new e-commerce companies uh, popping up all the time. And then also the e-commerce creates a different challenge, which is uh, uh, logistics not, 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 no longer you compete against your region, you compete from anybody in the whole world. I can give you an example that my wife ordered a patch uh, uh, through online, it cost $2, and when, when it got home, it came from Thailand, and it, it paid $4 duty for importing. I said, what, what, what is this business? 
<laughs> but uh, I mean, of course they're losing money, but when you can buy anything uh, right now from your smartphone and they send it all the way from China and you receive it at your home, that's totally a change in logistics. Uh, it's not anymore that the product comes into a local market, uh, it's uh, been fulfilled and then it's being distributed. Uh, same with Amazon. I mean, Amazon is changing the whole concept of, uh, of uh, e-commerce and, uh, and now all the, the, the supply chain in, in the grocery as well. Every single month there is a new store going into online, uh, online delivery systems and, uh, and, and trying to change the concepts. Uh, so, so it's it's a very very interesting industry, uh, and, and the the pace that, that all these changes are happening uh, is hard to keep up. But uh, but definitely, I mean, in in our case, we we have a select team that uh, are trying to figure out on a daily basis where where all this is moving, and uh, it is clear that if we don't bring a, a different solution, because. This is a solution that uh, will facilitate our customers how to get from the manufacturing <coughs> to the consumer faster and more efficiently. Uh, we might we might be able we might disappear. I mean, um, right. the, the, a lot of logistics companies are going to disappear in the queue. Now, uh, a topic that has been on the press now for uh, for a while, especially uh, press coming from Mexico, and I, I would like to ask Carlos and. <coughs> and Veronica to talk about this a little bit is the presidential elections in Mexico in July. How is the process or what may happen or are the elections in Mexico affecting somehow the renegotiation process that we have? If I had a crystal ball. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, just, just so, a, no, just no, no, a, no, no, no. I'm kidding. The, the thing is Presidential elections in Mexico for any Mexican right now are sort of like, you know, this topic that it goes over and over and over because we've seen this guy come for elections, one of the current candidates for. Twice already. This is the third time. Third time, right. right. So um, I think personally uh, that, I mean, you, we're on the seventh round of negotiations. There's an eighth scheduled round. Right. You know, this is supposed to end on Monday, the 5th, and I don't think they're going to end up, we, we can hope, but. Honestly, I don't think we're going to come out with a solution on this seventh round. And the eighth round scheduled, I believe, for March. April. March. The end of March. At the end of March. Right. Beginning of April. Um, but in, even if that does not yield a solution or a, a, a turnable, a, you know, a bipartisan agreement, if you will, I'm, I'm not sure that that's a good thing for the U.S. I think that's actually something that would be better for Mexico because we don't know exactly what uh, Manuel you know, would do, Lopez Obrador. But I, he's more likely to be against any kind of, you know, he's very protectionist in his speech, in his theories, in his, so it's, it's more of a risk, I think, for the U.S. for us to walk away. I mean, it's, it's a risk on both sides. But the, the agreements will continue to go on right, right. after the election. No, I think we have a, a, a brutal time in the world. I think that... Uh, politics has moved into extremely populist views where all the rationality that we were taught in the economic school when, when we used to study becomes like, what are we talking about? No, money is worth nothing, investment is irrational, uh, the price of things are not being easy to calculate, politicians are making promises to get elected, and we're out of rationality. The negotiators are negotiating NAFTA as if it was a business deal. When I would have loved to be in the side of the U.S. You were being sponsored by the world, being able to buy production of all the world on very cheap way by a believing on the currency. And it was fabulous. It, it, it created the largest consuming market ever existed in the history of humanity and probably the largest that will ever exist. And now we're destroying all the supply chain and putting it into doubt. And we're trying to create unequal equations in the economy. I don't know if you speak to the people of Andres Manuel, and they seem rational. These guys tell you that not everything is going to change, 
that they understand the market, but they are hugely concerned about social injustice. And we're all concerned about social injustice. Social injustice got Trump elected in the US. You gotta, uh, I was reading the hillbilly eulogy and you wanna cry what's happening in mid-America. It's terrifying. It's we, uh, every time I, I, I was with a banker, I told him I wanna go and visit the US that we don't know. We don't know flyover. And the Americans don't know many things about Mexico. And we were starting to understand each other. So this election and these Correct. next month, I was talking with some of the negotiators of NAFTA. Uh, and, and, and they're pretty concerned because they understand that we have become intralinked markets. You cannot break them. We won't be able to produce. We need to shout about what's happening. And yet we have to be concerned in Mexico about the people in mid-America and how we incorporate them to production. I love there was this beautiful magazine that came out in the Atlantic Monthly about five years ago that talked about manufacturing America. And I was super excited because I said, the US is gonna come back to what it really does well. Right. That's a manufacturing country and we are part of that supply chain. So I think the opportunity of NAFTA is bringing these three incredible countries like Canada, who is huge and with a very small population, the US that has created a believable rule of law. And I think that's something we haven't touched today. Right. The most important right. thing about NAFTA was our ability to sit down that's and right. negotiate differences. Sure. The, that was a fabulous way of creating the largest market. And we need to scream to our politicians, down there to the ones coming in, whomever he is, right. and to the ones that are here. I think that is the thing to underline right now. You know, I, I think it's, it, your right. comment about the, the rule of law uh, is very important because there are a number of uh, small and medium sized companies in the United States that they themselves do not go overseas because they are afraid about a lot of things. But when they know that they are working under a free trade agreement, in this case with NAFTA, they know that this agreement gives the parameters in which they can operate. And in many ways for especially small and medium sized companies, the NAFTA has become almost like a security blanket for their businesses. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. Mm -hmm. But Richard, you, you had a comment? Yeah, just two thoughts. One, NAFTA provided certainty. I knew where I was going. I knew the rules of the road. I couldn't make a left turn from the right-hand lane. It just made sense. Uh, and it clarified so much for us. Um, you all can go do your fact-checking. Recently, at the beginning of this negotiation, um, the President of the United States said, we want to buy America clause in NAFTA. And I thought, North American free trade agreement with a buy America clause? It just didn't make any sense to me. And so I'm sitting here as just a pragmatic and practical businessman who wants to manufacture a good product and ship it over to those uh, in Mexico and America, sir, who want to take the uh, product from us. And when I hear things like this, it's just, it's irrational. And I would ask all of you who are younger than I, me anyway, to get out and get involved and pay attention to what's going on. Let your voices be heard, you're bright people. We need your help because you see the color of my hair, I'm gonna retire. And you guys are the future, and I don't mean to get too carried away, Carlos, but <laughs> my gosh, we really have an opportunity here to, to continually improve our free trade agreement, but we're not gonna do it if we listen to alternative facts and we get confused with what the political speak is. This is just good business. Sorry, Before we go into uh, the audience question, please, I want to ask one more question for all the panelists. Um, last year, I was very fortunate that I was moderating a panel discussion about uh, free trade agreements. And one of the speakers, uh, and I was very honored for that, uh, was Mickey Kanner. Mm. Mickey Kanner, who um, was the Secretary of Commerce. Sure, from LA. He was the head of the US Trade Representative. And we were debating and with a lot of the audience people in, uh, about free trade agreements, and Mickey Kanner said something that uh, now I'm gonna ask all of you. He basically said, 
buyers and sellers will always exist with or without free trade agreements. So the question now is, so let's assume that NAFTA is changed or mm. not even ratified. Would our buyers and sellers continue operating? Obviously, it will be under harder conditions. But I will imagine that the market forces will allow everybody else to synchronize whatever they do after NAFTA. Any comments on that? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. yeah, I mean, simple. I mean, uh, Trump is here for seven years the most. Trade is going to continue <laughs> forever. No, for only three years, right? Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, let's I'm saying the most, so, yeah. so hopefully it's only two more, only three more. But anyway, uh, I mean, definitely it's going to continue. Uh, and, and this is part of, uh, I think, what, is what, what Richard was pointing out to you guys. The, it's, it's on the stakeholders, the, the businessmen, the community, the uh, consumer groups, uh, anybody that it's affected by the changes in the NAFTA, it's our duty to speak up, to, to get together, to fight uh, the, the, the government or the decisions ma made by the governments, and, uh, and find ways to continue the trade. Uh, there's, I mean, in the United States, it's over six million people living, uh, depend, I mean, jobs depends on the NAFTA. So if NAFTA goes away, these people need to they need to work and uh, the manufacturers need to keep producing. So, so trade one way or another will have to, will continue. How or what's yeah, going no. to happen? I mean, that's a different story. Something's going to happen and, 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 and but we all need to figure it out. Well, I mean, I think we all have established here that we all think that leaving NAFTA would be a catastrophe for both right. parties and we don't want that. And, and we don't think the responsible, hopefully responsible people are negotiating this will let that happen. But we've been surprised before. <laughs> so what I want to say is, you know, as a company, we had to consider all of these scenarios. And we produce food, and our raw materials come mostly from the US. And if we went away, if it went away, we would go up to um, most Brazil? favored nation. Yeah. So That's like 75% tariff on turkey and 20% tariff on cheese. And, and we've looked at other sources. And yes, it would be more expensive in some cases, and it would be harder to develop these sources, and we would have to test our processes again, and we have been doing that stuff. But we would adapt. And I think, like you say, the markets would rebalance. And that rebalancing, in the end, knowing what I know and what I've grown with in Mexico um, most of my life, I think we would come out and be strong again, because we've done this so many times, mm -hmm. so many, you know, devaluations and our, our dollar comes and goes and we just rebuild. We're just the kind of people that, you know, we were talking about the cash right. in one of the other panels. We have a huge informal cash market and, and it has a lot to do, <coughs> although I understand they're not wanting to pay taxes, but a lot of it has to do because people have, you know, they just create their own businesses out of nothing. We, it's just this, the trade will continue one way or another. Um, it's just, we're going to have to rebalance where most of the profit goes. And unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be in a way that will benefit the U.S. Right. Carlos? I think <coughs> buyers and sellers are always out there. And I, I was hearing Mr. Blankfield about two years ago in Davos, and he was saying that the only thing that Goldman Sachs did was basically manage risk. But when it becomes riskier, there's three things that happen. The first, we invest less. Investment is based in return. It's a money, it's a fungible thing. And we have this beautiful market, uh, trying to explain it to the guy that talks about everything's beautiful and everything works. And, and it was, everything was beautiful. Fake news. And it was perfect. It was growing, the, it was going deeper, and there was a reason to do things that way. If we break it, it's going to be broken. Right. There's more risk. Fungibility of money is going to go to Asia. Fungibility of money is going to go to South America. Fungibility of money is going to go to Eastern Europe. I was talking some years ago with Mr. Salinas, and he says, when I built NAFTA, my idea was that the wall was coming down, 
and that the U.S. was going to change its view from south to east. And if I opened the Mexican market, I would mm. become incorporated to the largest market in the world. Right. And it happened. Mexico went from a three-city country to I don't, cannot tell you how many cities. There were no Walmarts. Now they open 10 or 20 a year. Mm -hmm. it's, it's massive. Why do we want to break it? Why do we want to tear this thing down? We need to be, it's going back to it. Consumers are going to be worse. The people in mid-America are going to have less money to work with, less people to sell to, and less money to buy with. So I think this is, we don't need to take it small. We all, it'll end up being nice. There was 1929. There was 2008. Eight. Mm -hmm. Markets don't exactly survive. Right. Right. We need to take care of markets. Good. Good, sir. Uh, I'm reminded of two things. At one of our sessions, uh, it was a closed door session. Press was asked to uh, don't report or leave the room. And I think it's Foreign Minister Vidigare. I'm not. Vidigare. I apologize if I don't pronounce it right. I have never seen a more calm purposeful and thoughtful person stand up representing Mexico and said, you know, we can be patient. We are resilient. We are, our economy is uh, on the move forward. And in four years, there'll be someone else at your White House. And what he sort of taught us is to stay the course that we can negotiate this. The other thing that I thought, and maybe it's not quite the right phrasing, but um, an Americano, um, I really think that Mexico is perhaps, right now, more resilient than the United States. And to Veronica's point, don't go find grain somewhere else. In Cargill Corporation and others where we produce corn throughout our Midwest and we ship most of it to Mexico, they'll find somewhere else to get the corn. Then we're going to try and figure out what happened to us. And it might not be too late, but it's sure going to be very tough. There's always buyers and sellers. but we have to make sure that we want to continue that trade and not leave it up to the politicians to decide who can trade and who can't trade. And I just got to go back and tell you, I'm, I'm a fan of Mexico, and I really believe that uh, they're going to weather the storm and they may do a better job than we do here in the States. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry okay. to say. Just hoping for questions from the audience. Hello. My name is uh, Adrian Ceballos, and uh, I'm an international student here at UCLA. I'm from uh, Sinaloa, Mexico, a big exporting uh, state. And uh, I had a question for you guys. And what do you think is the U.S.'s main concern in the re renegotiations of NAFTA? And is the issue of intellectual property and copyright still a major issue? Oh, wow. Anyone? Well, I think the major issue that they're seeing is that they think that the jobs for the manufacturing on the automotive side have come down to Mexico. But I think it's a, you know, it's, it's a biased view because, as we were talking about, the retaliatory measures are not going to create those jobs back in the U.S. And I think at this point the U.S. doesn't have the capacity to actually produce 50 percent of the content, which is what the U.S. wants to establish, like 85 percent regional but 50 percent U.S. based. Um, is the, but the, on the part of intellectual property, to be honest, I, I think maybe somebody else has a better answer well, than I do. Richard, I, I, I think I, Richard commented on um, I'm still stuck back on I can't believe my, my country is doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we, we will adopt you. You're Thank officially you. Mexican now. Coming down, I promise. Yeah, we get local um, I think the biggest consideration here is that we have a man in the White House who says, I'm the best deal maker there is. And he shut down the, you know, we were doing great with NAFTA. I don't think anybody was complaining. We were all ready to open it up to continuous improvement, look at the electronic age, and look at, you know, what's the certificate of origins and the details of this stuff. This guy said, we're not going to go with NAFTA. Threw everybody off, and now we're forced into a negotiation that may not necessarily had to been as cumbersome as it's been today given the negotiators. So I think the biggest issue for us with this renegotiation is, once again, pull the politicians out of this thing 
and let's let practical business people who need to buy and sell on both sides of the border get our goods down to, to the food industry, get our goods down through the roads that are being built. I mean, they're building great roads, and it's going to cost us more money to ship down there, and someone's going to have to pay for that. So I think it's, I'm sorry I'm all over the place, but um, it's really about uh, the political will has to be tampered with, or tempered, excuse me, with the business will. Thank you. I hope that helps. Thank you. Next question. Uh, my name is Fernando. I'm a, I'm a MBA student from USC Marshall. And my question is, um, us as business people, what resources do we have to influence public policy and to mobilize ourselves? I, I think that we've created <laughs> a big laguna, a huge river between business people and politicians. Unfortunately, when business people went into politics, it got worse. Because <laughs> right now we have business people <laughs> managing it politics. that way. Especially those who created Atlantic City, no? But um, <laughs> we, we, who's not there anymore. But uh, I think that we need to believe ourselves not as business people or politicians. <coughs> There's good people in the both sides. I think we need to believe in citizens that believe in creating nations and creating markets if we want to be market economies. We can create other kinds of things, but the main reason that has created this huge global richness, this wealth, Pinker was coming out with this recent book, uh, came out last week giving statistics that this is the best time in the economy of the world. Yes, there's social injustice and there's many unfairness happening, but there's never been this wealth. We, we can talk to each other on a phone. We see faces thousands of miles away. We're able to finance corporations in China and Chinese are able to finance corporations in Argentina. Fintech. We need to understand how the markets work, and business people need to be realists. We need to pay taxes. We need to pay salaries. Salaries are the way to finish with social injustice. If we, if we yes. keep on, so we need to get involved. We need to become citizens. We are fortunate, and we need to be part of politics, and politicians need to be part of business, and politicians need to get very well paid, because if you pay them badly, you'll have bad people. Who guys of your <laughs> MBA are going to go to work in politics It's going to be able to pay its college credits? It's impossible. There's no way. So the best people are going out. We need to change the world. And this is your opportunity. Yeah. I'm getting, he's getting wider, I'm getting bolder. <laughs> Who is your turn, guys? <laughs> we want to help you. We're here Go ahead, for that. Marcelo. Yeah, I, I think when, when something not too good <laughs> happens, uh, good things happen. And I think uh, uh, everything here about the NAFTA and Trump and the new policy and uh, against Mexico and all that, I think has brought a lot of good things for Mexico. Uh, uh, especially on the way Mexico deal with, I mean, Mexicans deal with Mexicans. Before uh, us as Mexicans, we used to work uh, on, on our own, uh, our own paths and everybody just kind of waves and not like the Jewish community that they're all together and they have more power than, than, the, than the Mexicans in the U.S., even though they are like a, a, a portion of the number of Mexicans that, that are here in the U.S. So. Uh, with all these things that ha have happened, Mexicans are getting together for one same goal. And, and, and we need to take advantage of that. So, so uh, back to your questions, there are organizations like the Mexican Entrepreneur Association. There is for uh, also uh, a, a young, young people or, or students, or uh, I think they are based in, the, the headquarter right now is based on USC which is a competition, but I think you, you should talk to them and, uh, and get together and, and, and raise your voice. Uh, you can send letters to senators and uh, uh, speak up in, in like conference like this. Everything helps, uh, but, but let's take this, this moment that all Mexicans are getting together for one same goal. Richard? 
Yeah, just a, a true story. Um, my congressman didn't like uh, the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. <laughs> he wasn't too keen on NAFTA. His, uh, I'm not going to give you his name. Uh, but he came by the plant and he visited with us and he, he was honest and he said, I don't care for this. So we took the picture of the entire company, you know, all the employees with the congressman, put it up on the wall. And then we called the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and asked for all the statistics about our trade with Mexico and the value that it's created on both sides of the border. We put the posters up on the wall and we invited the congressman back to take another picture. This time he took the picture by the posters. He doesn't sing the same tune anymore about NAFTA. So you all can go contact where you live, your member of Congress, and say, I'm here and I'm concerned. They'll take that letter and they will do something about it, believe it or not. And you can aggregate yourselves and say, you know, from the Anderson School of Advanced Business from Management, here's how we see this going forward. I'd love to see a collective discussion about how you all would deal with the 26, 25 chapters in NAFTA and what you would recommend because frankly, you're, again, this is a smart house here and these members of Congress who are sitting out in Missouri, they don't get the talent that you guys have sitting here. So do something practical, talk to your members, invite them. You know, you get a chance, bring them in. Uh, they always want to talk to a big crowd and then ask them good <laughs> questions. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm just, I think, uh, yeah, go just on. one last thing, and it goes to your question and the one before, which I felt I, we didn't properly answer any of us, but I noticed that um, either UCLA uh, admits an, an uncharacteristically high number of Mexican students, or only the Mexican students make the questions, because I saw, <laughs> <laughs> In, which either way, I approve, okay? <laughs> That's fine. No, I'm kidding. But I am really happy to see that there are a lot of Mexican students sitting yes, here, but also that we see a lot of interest from other people here about this NAFTA. And I want to say that something that what was said in an earlier part, of also I think it was Kate, she was saying about how whatever you write and whatever's in your brain is also content. And we were talking about, you know, intellectual content and what's, what's that going to happen yes. in NAFTA. Well, you are one of the brightest minds in the country, in many countries, because if you come to UCLA, it's because you were accepted from a large amount of people. And so you're bright already, and you have something. You're carrying it with you, and that's your intellectual property. And you decide which border to cross and what to use it for. There you go. With that, I think we want to welcome our panelists for being with us. Thank you.